I now give the floor to Ms. Leda Zerugi. Merci. Thank you. Good morning, President, distinguished members of the Council. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to update you on the situation in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and to present to you the progress that has been made in the post-electoral transition process as well as the main challenges that we still face. It is now more than six months since the elections of December 2018 and it is therefore high time that we consider what progress has been made and to examine the political situation in the country. It is my conviction that a fair analysis in the current context obliges us to express both satisfaction and concern. Today, in talking to you, I would like to reiterate the messages that I have continued to transmit, messages of hope and optimism. President Chisikedi clearly expressed his intention to initiate brave reforms. If these reforms are completely implemented, they should lead to the reinforcement of Congolese institutions and the improvement of the quality of life of the Congolese people. We've also seen progressive improvement in relations between the Democratic Republic of the Congo and its neighbours since President Chisikedi took office. He is determined to make the Great Lakes region a haven of peace and development by promoting good relations with neighbouring countries and by promoting regional inter economic integration. He's therefore actively committed to diplomatic initiatives with the countries in the region in order to achieve these objectives. With this in mind, I will continue to work closely with the Special Envoy for the Great Lakes region and in coordination with the relevant regional organisations to support the Congolese authorities in the implementation of agreements contained in the Framework Agreement for Peace, Security and Cooperation for the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the region. Mr President, distinguished members of the Council, the Prime Minister was nominated on the 20th of May, but nonetheless we are still waiting for a new government to be formed. Laborious negotiations are continuing on this subject between the two platforms of the coalition in power, Cap pour le changement, which is the party of President Chisekedi, and the Front commun pour le Congo of the former President Joseph Kabila. We understand that this is an unprecedented exercise for the country. But even so, I would call on all involved to overcome their differences to quickly respond to the population's expectations. The lack of an operational government makes it difficult to establish robust relations with partners and to implement the important reforms in governance and institutions, reforms that could consolidate a process of transition that remains fragile. In recent months, I have met the major stakeholders in this process. I have vigorously encouraged them to preserve the gains that have been made during the elections and the peaceful transition of power and encourage them to make the necessary concessions to lead to a government being formed. I should nonetheless underscore that we have seen constructive processes at local level with significant initiatives being taken to promote stability and development on the part of certain governors. President. Members. In the, context, in the context of the mission eventual exit, MONUSCO has 
closed a number of field offices in areas where there is no longer a serious threat of armed conflict. This will permit us to concentrate our resources on the support to the strengthening of state institutions, as well as to protect to the protection of civilian in areas where conflict and activities of armed groups continue to have a devastating impact on civilians. The report before you provides a detailed account of the security situation. Over the course of the past weeks, however, the level of violence increased in several areas in the eastern part of the country. In this regard, I'm concerned with the current situation in Ituri province, where spoilers are seeking to play on ethnic tensions to instigate inter-community violence. In addition, attacks by ADF continue to exact an intolerable toll on civilians. In Masisi, armed groups, including the NDCR of Guidon Shimirai Mouissa, are responsible for atrocities, notably conflict-related sexual violence, committed against the population. Violence continues to be the main cause of humanitarian needs in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. As a result, the country is currently facing simultaneous emergency situations, including mass displacement and protection threats. In Italy, more than 350,000 people are displaced in Jugu, Mahagi, and Irumu territories following renewed violence. The deterioration of the security situation is interrupting the return process that had been gradually taking place since 2018 causing new displacement towards Bunia and forcing the humanitarian community to reorient its assistance to the most vulnerable population, important gaps remain. To date, 700, 733,000 people are in need of assistance in Italy province. In South Kivu, the flare-up in intercommunity violence and armed group activity has displaced up to 180,000 people. Added to this is the ever-increasing concern of the Ebola epidemic, which has now claimed the lives of more than 1,700 people. Recent isolated cases, both in Goma and across the border with Uganda, have heightened concerns about its spread outside of the Beni and Butembo areas, leading WHO to declare the epidemic as a public health emergency of international concern. <clears throat> I take this opportunity to underline that the problems faced in eradicating this disease are not only <coughs> epidemiological in nature. They are linked as well to a variety of political and social factors, which include the activities of armed groups, such as the ADF and Mai Mai, along with continuing high levels of community distrust around the response to the epidemic. <clears throat> this influence of factors has resulted in a deadly environment for the people working to counter Ebola, to the point of being specifically threatened and killed by armed groups. I would like to thank countries and donors for their generosity, which has helped to fund the Ebola response, and call on everyone to generously support the fourth strategic response plan for the Ebola virus disease that was just presented to member states in Geneva last week, 
while also underlining the serious need for financing the response to other epidemiological and humanitarian crises that the DRC is facing. The measles outbreak, for example, has already claimed the lives of more than 2,000 people since the beginning of this year, even more than Ebola. Mr. President, distinguished council members, in response to these challenges, we are leading a one UN approach that combines a number of different tools at both the national and provincial levels, we engage with a variety of stakeholders to diffuse social and political tensions. Our military and police components continue to provide support to the Congolese security forces in efforts to secure the affected area and adequately response, respond to the activities of armed groups. The mission is supporting the Congolese authorities in executing an arrest warrant against NDCR leader Guidon and in strengthening the performance of Congolese justice to fight impunity. UN agencies are working under the coordination of my deputy, who serves as the resident, resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator to provide an effective response to the humanitarian crisis. MONUSCO is providing as well political and logistical support to the newly appointed UN Ebola Emergency Response Coordinator. I would also like to draw your attention to the opportunity presented by the increasing number of armed combatants who have expressed willingness to lay down their whip weapons since President Chesekedi's assumption of office. The groups in question include the Kamwin and Sapo in the Kasais, as well as Mai Mai and Tua militia in South Kivu and Tanganyika. MONUSCO is working closely with the Congolese authorities to support them in the response to this opportunity, including helping in the mobilization of funds from the World Bank and the Peace Building Fund. In the context of my good offices, I have placed a priority on encouraging the authorities to adopt a community integration approach for these ex-combatants, advising against any broad-based plan to integrate them into the security forces. The broad integration of ex-combatants into the army and police forces in previous years only led to the degradation of their capacities, the hijacking of security policy by parallel networks and incentivizing the creation of illegal armed groups. Mr. President, distinguished council members, there is still a great deal of work that lies before us as we continue the process of charting MONUSCO future drawdown and exit. I believe that the independent strategic review, which recently completed its information gathering mission in the DRC and in the region, will present to you a report later this year that outlines clearly the challenges that remain in this regard. <clears throat> in the face of these issues, MONUSCO is making the best use of the funds made available to the mission, even though our budgetary challenges are stretching our resources to the limit. I thank the Council for its support with understanding that the continued support of this Council and Member States for MONUSCO will be critical to the ultimate success of the mission and its ability to exit the DRC under the appropriate conditions. <clears throat> Mr. President, distinguished member, Council members, thank you for your attention.